Sure. Yeah. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us to the taking OpenStack to the enterprise session. Uh, I know it's pretty much the last uh, session today, so you are actually uh, 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 can give yourself a good. <laughs> now that I've survived the whole day with all the session, I know it's pretty hard to absorb uh, uh, OpenStack Summit sessions. Uh, uh, and I think the topic we have today in SIG is, is a very important one, right? Um, and it's it's called taking OpenStack to the enterprise. And what we'll try to do in the next about 40 minutes is to understand first of all what enterprise mean, right? Because we heard a lot of buzzword enterprise uh, sessions today uh, around that name, but we, we want to understand what actually it means. And, and to zoom into uh, what we have done in order to deliver uh, a solution uh, that we believe is good enough for uh, production in enterprise, right? But that's the missing piece probably that we're missing in the enterprise ready. Uh, with me I have today, uh, Arkady, Arkady, you want to uh, present yourself? Sure. I, I just want to, uh, my name is Sean Coyne. I'm a principal product manager for OpenStack in Red Hat. And uh, I'm going to cover the, the our side of the story. And Arkady will take so, it. Uh, I'm Arkady Kanevsky. I'm a director of development uh, on the Dell side, uh, jointly working uh, with uh, Red Hat team on the delivering you the enterprise level uh, joint solution. Uh, Mr. Croci, who is our PM, who is supposed to be here, unfortunately, have to leave for the family emergency. So I'm kind of stepping in. Uh, to take care of uh, his portion of the presentation. Thank you, Arkady. So we'll start by looking at the uh, uh, evolution of enterprise in OpenStack. Um, as I said, what is exactly, who is exactly the enterprise that we're sp speaking about? Um, and why is OpenStack good for enterprise and vice versa, right? Uh, uh, w the notion of uh, OpenStack to be a scale out, maybe just maybe for public provider, et cetera, uh, is one. But we also have a, a, a very large interest in enterprise. And we will take a step at that. And then we're going to actually zoom in to our approach. And why does it matter? Uh, uh, in, in one sentence, we have released uh, already the third version uh, lately of the cloud solution that is based on uh, the joint solution of Red Hat and, and Dell. Uh, and uh, it's the reference architect that we'll have for you to as a link at the end is all out there. But we call it a reference architect, but it's actually much more than a reference architect, right? So a reference architecture is, is, uh, is good for uh, reference for implementation, but it, we're actually offering a whole solution that you can actually stand out tomorrow morning that we know works. <laughs> and that's the key, right? So uh, OpenStack is a very complex uh, infrastructure to set up. And deployment is one of the key aspects that we'll touch today. Um, and then we're going to talk about where, we, where we're going, what's, what's, what's the future looks like, as well as some of the key takeaways. So we'll start with just looking at enterprise mentioned in OpenStack Summit. And when we look back at Austin Diablo, uh, pretty much then with what we don't know and we don't care about enterprise, right? We, we're just starting the project. Um, and uh, there was no even notion of enterprise uh, features or whatever enterprise is ready or not. We just wanted to stand up a cloud infrastructure uh, software, which is open source and stand it up, right? Later on, moving to Essex and Folsom, we started to gather requirements and how the enterprise can actually benefit from it. And it's getting ready for it, but not, not really. Only in Grizzly and High South, uh, we moved to what we called stabilizing mode when the summit talk started to appear with specific vendors enabling OpenStack for the OpenStack. So if I had uh, any backends supported, if it's a storage or network uh, story, I can connect it into OpenStack and make it enterprise, right? So that was pretty much the notion. And then moving up the stack, starting to look at Juno and Kilo release, uh, we're actually starting to have discussion around the core is ready. Um, and Gartner actually took a stab at it uh, uh, and, and made a statement that Juno release is the enterprise ready 1.0 release, right? And, and the reason is a lot of the key features uh, that requires enterprise adoption uh, only made it in, into Kilo release. Um, and we'll take a zoom in to some of highlighting some of them. But before we do, let's take a notion of what's enterprise IT. And typically, when, when uh, you look at uh, 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 solution promotion uh, uh, data center solution. You will see guys in suits standing in data centers. Great, this is that. But guess what? We're not. OpenStack, as I mentioned earlier, is a very complex uh, infrastructure to stand up. 
Uh, this is not what we're referring as an enterprise IT. Also not as consumers, because if you look at the persona that actually consume and stand up cloud services today, is, is not the classic old-fashioned one that only consumes services. Today, IT role has changed to be a service provider within the organization. So if I'm a consuming a, or standing up a cloud infrastructure, I need to actually provide services within my organization or organization that include different service catalog items. It can be storage, compute, et cetera, but in a cloud fashion. So in a sense, this is no longer <laughs> representative of enterprise IT. Um, and when we look at what enterprise IT and who they are, so, uh, so who they are, I know it when I see it, right? So it's not the Fortune 500 equals enterprise, right? Uh, today, when we look at enterprise need, Specifically, when we're discussing standing up cloud infrastructure, uh, we have small organization, uh, <laughs> much smaller than Fortune 500, that has the same needs, right? And the main reason is you need to do more with less. So cost is driven also in cloud infrastructure. And the same IT organization that used to provide services now needs to provide, as I mentioned, IT as a service with the same pretty much budget. Uh, this actually drives us where they're running. So in, in the larger responsibility of they still need to run and support the legacy, traditional, propriety, or even investments they, they've done in equipment, uh, just standing up the, the old-fashioned databases, but they also uh, are, and, and they're also bound to what we call pets. The, we have the notion of cattle and pets in, in cloud. And, and when we talk about pets application, they still need to provide services in them. And when we see also the adoption moving to OpenStack, or in general, from enterprise to cloud infrastructure, we don't see a forklift upgrade, right? It's not that we're going to replace the whole traditional uh, IT investment we have, and boom, we graded to OpenStack, and we're done. Uh, the, one of the reasons is we still need to provide the services. And some of the services are, uh, are proprietary uh, uh, software that we built in our IT to support. Some of the services are still very traditional databases, Oracle, SAP, et cetera, that needs to uh, provide services. And not all the services actually fit to the cloud uh, infrastructure uh, because they were not cloud-born, right? They have specific AJ requirements, for example, uh, et cetera. Um, what do they do? So they support everything from the data center to the end user. And service provider for different uh, 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 levels of op opera business operations, right? Uh, and we also have the, uh, when we talk, there's a notion of frictionless IT. All of us are IT users, and we have uh, cell phones, mobile phones that we carry that uh, provide us different experience, user experience, when we leave our work, right? Because we can actually press a button and get the app we need, whether it's uh, uh, getting information or, or on our flight or uh, getting a, a, a social network GPS to get to take us home, et cetera. But where is IT? Do, do, do the IT already made that to that point to be fractionless IT, but we're not there yet. Cloud infrastructure allows us to get there. Um, and when we look at OpenStack community support for enterprise, so uh, we came a long way in the last 11 releases of OpenStack. Uh, the expansion of design summits to embrace the higher level of conversations. Uh, to those of you who attended today's sessions, and, and, and we're just starting now the design session themselves, there's a lot of key elements being discussed that are, that are missing from the table, right? Every release, we're getting better. The good news, we have very short cycles. Every six months, we get a, able to deliver a set of new features. And when we look at the enterprise and product manager working groups, this is something new that was not there before. And Arkady maybe can elaborate more uh, uh, about this, but we started to have a, a working group within OpenStack to actually tackle uh, the, enter the window enterprise need. We started to have discussion around, OK, it's time for us to look ahead at the, the OpenStack uh, uh, development cycle and start to see where we're going in terms of driving changes in a much more early fashion to actually uh, put some product management. It, yes, it's an open source product uh, uh, software, but we still need to put the frameworks. Uh, you, you, uh, one, one good indication is that just look at the number of attendees uh, in the summit, right? It's all around 6,000 people. Uh, uh, so if that's just the people attending, you saw how, how many lines of code we have in OpenStack, you can do the math, right? We need that framework uh, to come alive. Another side effect of this is the number of drivers. We have more devices, more hardware, 
uh, that is plugged into OpenStack uh, because we have more and more vendor interested to providing, and, and, and again, OpenStack is all about being a uh, pluggable infrastructure. However, who's doing the CI? Uh, how is the CI being done? The CI is the continuous integration testing uh, uh, for these new devices with OpenStack. Uh, uh, are they certified or not, et cetera? And of course, uh, uh, what does this mean from uh, uh, the commercial distributions to provide longer support cycle for this uh, uh, roll across the train that upgrades and uh, provides uh, updates every six months. Um, with that, I want to actually zoom into the Dell and Red Hat approach uh, to this so far. So in a sense, a lot of our work is considered to be the, the, the boring things. However, it's the boring thing that matters. Um, and I mentioned earlier that only in the last two cycles, pretty much, we got to a much more stable core. So we got the core right. However, making OpenStack repeatable is something that we need in order to be able to deliver it in production, right? I just, for, for me, just to stand up today in an OpenStack environment, I need to stand up nine different services. Uh, if I need to do the same thing all over again in my next data center or my next uh, site, will that experience be repeatable? If it's not repeatable, then it's not ready. Right? So we need to uh, come up with a repeatable routine that we can deploy OpenStack that we know that works. Uh, and of course, we'll go into data in, in the next slide. Uh, we need to make OpenStack testable. So I mentioned the drivers and the number of complexity uh, with uh, uh, just supporting all this rich ecosystem. And when it comes to best practices and configuration, there's more than one way to configure edge eight. There's more than one way to stand up uh, your, your deployment. Uh, just take networking, for example, with Nova Networks and Neutron, with all the different configuration, which is the right one. Um, and of course, uh, fewer snowflakes. So in a, in a sense, OpenStack is, uh, we, we, we try to get to a point where OpenStack just works. Right? So what is the uh, uh, delivery model that allows us to provide uh, an open stack that does, just works without having like a car that's sensei uh, uh, to fix it for us? Right? And with that, I want to hand it off to Arkady um, to showcase what we have in the uh, third release of the joint solution. That uh, we will not try to have a specialized things for each individual uh, uh, deployment because a it is uh, very hard to make it work uh, you know the first time and then you would like to kind of repeat the process so you share the experience uh, and the second thing we wanted to ensure that uh, you know instead of trying to optimize it for a specific individual need we wanted to start with something which is kind of good enough for uh, you know majority of the use cases and when I say good enough, I don't mean just uh, the configuration of the OpenStack, which is what this community is kind of concentrating on, but actually go one step beyond and have you know end-to-end -end solution, which includes hardware, uh, the distribution, all of the configuration, all of the resiliency features, and all of the things which we, as kind of the end user, take for granted, but somebody goes and have to make sure it all works. Uh, so. We uh, kind of come up with uh, uh, kind of base base things. Uh, as uh, Sean mentioned, uh, the June release was kind of the first release we felt comfortable enough uh, to make uh, to make kind of ready for enterprise. This is actually the first release which we felt comfortably to move away from Nova networking to the Neutron, and as the first release we jointly created, which was Neutron based. By no means we means that we will support all the different options which are possible even for the networking. We actually decided explicitly that we're going to support only one specific option. And the reason one because that one we tested well enough. We know it will perform under the stress. It will perform properly under the failure, failure conditions. And it will deliver the scalability which the customer then expects to do. Uh, Right from the start, uh, you know, we call it reference architecture, uh, but in reality, it is the reference. Uh, it's a kind of minimal production uh, solution we wanted to deliver to the customer, and because of that, uh, some of the features like HA is built in right from the beginning. You know, it doesn't matter how small it is; you will have the full HA capability. Not only HA, but it will be active, active HA across all of the services in the in the solution. Uh, 
we made a very conscious decision about what kind of hardware we would like to have in the solution, and we chose the one which is uh, balanced performance-wise. It's not the, you know, the, the, the best possible we can do, uh, but at the same time, we were kind of consciously made a decision of price-performance ratio, what is the right choice for the starter platform. Uh, so I'm not going to walk through all of the different possible configuration, uh, but there is one other thing which I do want to bring into, uh, into uh, uh, focus, and that is we decided fairly early on that uh, while we will support multiple different backend storages, we actually, as a base solution, would like to have Ceph as a core cornerstone of the solution. And the reason is because that allows us to have a single type of storage, even though we can configure multiple different pools for different purposes, but we'll have a single storage cluster which support all of the needs of the solution. It supports the sender, it supports the images in the glance, it supports ephemeral storage, it allows us to do the live migration, it supports various different things, but at the same time, you are, it's a software-defined storage, so it can scale out as the need uh, as you go forward and try to get a larger uh, production solution without any forklift changes or anything else. Uh, and uh, also, it allows us to, uh, uh, to, uh, er, uh, to run it on the base hardware, uh, you know, commodity hardware, which you know you can uh, you can buy, and we configure it actually very similarly uh, all the way across the entire platform, uh, end to end. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So one other thing, you know, while we can talk about you know here all of the components which make the solution uh, and make sure everything works. At the end, it is actually the processes we should put in place to make sure that we have a repeatable process, both for the quality of the solution going forward, as well as ability to uh, provide the tools to the field, either the customer or the service organization, to ensure that what was done and delivered to the customer is actually working all the way across. So it's not hoisted on the customer to go and figure out why certain services all of a sudden become flaky, or what was other problems might start happening. Uh, earlier on, uh, David was given a talk uh, about uh, one of the work we were doing upstream is we are using, uh, we are moving the Tempest uh, to be not only the gate in the open stack from which it was designed from date one, but using that as a tool which we can deliver to the customer so we can have that as a validator in the field. And has multiple different benefits because customer can you know run it at any time to validate that, that everything is all right. Uh, it doesn't you know it making sure that there is no side effect after running that, and you can kind of run it repeatedly to see if all of a sudden your uh, uh, your infrastructure which was running fine all of a sudden start getting flaky. Okay, um, on top of kind of delivering the tools to the customer, to the field, to be able to validate the solution in the field. Of course, we go through a fairly exhaustive testing process. We set up our own infrastructure, uh, actually joined, uh, such that we continuously testing every change which we are making on the software side, as well as any change potentially we wanted to uh, verify for the uh, reference, for architectural change on the, uh, on the stem continuously. So, we have the you know, joint uh, uh, infrastructure going on all the time. And not only testing the simple thing like API, which Tempest does, but we are also t testing the full HA capability. We have the full test injection, uh, of both on the node basis, on the, on, the on the storage sides, on the switches, on the NICs, and so on. So it's kind of very exhaustive level of testing to ensure that what delivered to the customer is working. Notice that we don't do it for the each platform we deliver to the customer. We do it for the entire solution. And you know, we repeat the same solution again and again. It's part of the building of the solution, which have those features right from the start. Uh, we, of course, provide the guidance. I mean, while this is, I mean, by definition, it's a reference architecture. So this is kind of the base you want to start from. 
but then we can go from there to various other ways of how to uh, improve things. Uh, either you want to scale the compute, you want to scale the uh, storage, you want to scale your networking, whatever, whatever the needs you have for your uh, specific application domain, we have a guidance of how to proceed. Um, for various uh, reason, for, for the robustness reason, as I mentioned, I'll get to that on network in a second, we actually have fairly uh, you know, dual redundant network all the way through the system. Uh, while uh, you know, I have seen too many other reference architectures, uh, and all of them kind of suffer with the same problem, which were part of the kind of built in the testing, which was part of the uh, CI of the Tempest uh, by the community, and that is every service becomes a separate network with a separate NIC of the v of the v on the on the VM to test it. It's definitely easier to test, but that's not what you're going to deliver to the customer. Uh, and every time you know you said, "Oh, okay, well, I need to connect it to something else." Well, you're not going to add another NIC to your system every time you want to make change. It's it's not going to scale. It will cause problems to the kazoo. And every time you have to do any change, you have to go and update a physical architecture. No way. So we kind of went from the beginning saying, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to have several physical networks. And on top of those physical networks, we're going to have the VLAN be specific for each of the flows. So you want to connect it to some other device? No problem. We create a VLAN. It's fully automated. You can, do, you, know, you can create your own tools if you want to, or you can you know, we'll provide that as a service. And uh, you, know, you can extend. Not the physical network, but the flows which you want to have in the network. Um, so I'll skip to that. Uh, we have all sorts of tools to help you out uh, right now how to configure the hardware. And actually, I'll go one step forward that actually we are actually very actively participating with the Ironic project to make sure that that becomes you know, hardware as a, as a service so we can configure it. Uh, it's actually, the work is way ahead of what is being done on the Ironic. Uh, we are, you know, as I'll mention in a, in a, in a few slides, we actually have uh, all of the configuration needed for the solution already built in into what is called RDO Manager, uh, which is a joint tool we are, we are developing, which allows us to not only do what Ironic can do right now in the killer, which was just released, but allows us to set up the bias, set up the rates, set up everything which you need for every of the node type for each of the function you need. You'll do one thing for the storage node because you want to set it up uh, you know, for the Ceph in a very one way, and you want to set it up for the compute node for virtualization in a completely different way. Not only it's different type of the hardware, but even if it's a similar type of hardware, you'll configure it differently for different purposes. And that's fully kind of automated work. What we're trying to deliver in the next set of the uh, you know next set of the solution coming coming after. Uh, let me spend just a couple of minutes uh, and kind of uh, outline the point what I was trying to make before. So if you look at the nodes, we kind of classify them in different categories, but all the nodes have somewhat similar structure with respect to the networking. We have two dual dual uh, dual port SNICs, and we bond those SNICs to provide you full redundancy, both with respect to the failure, but also for the uh, for the full performance connectivity. Uh, conceptual network can be separated into the three categories: one, you know, public ones, in which we only the public traffic will be run; the private one, which is basically for internal communication, uh, which will be running. And then uh, the, the, the management one, which is one gig, because you don't really need a very you know, high throughput for that. Uh, and we are price conscious to deliver the solution which is the best for the dollar. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you look at that, you have one pair of NICs, and you have five different networks sitting on top of that. And this is how we uh, take the VLANs and making sure all of them are operational uh, on top of that. And if you want to have one more flow connected to something else, maybe for a different type of storage, which you have already in your data center, or you will connect to one of your own internal uh, you know, databases, we can provide that without changing the architecture at all. Uh, the 
the physical infrastructure, I mean, which is kind of not here, but uh, all of the NICs are connected to the same pair of switches, which are, uh, which are uh, ensuring the full redundancy. And uh, we choose uh, right from the start and the configuration the type of the bonding we wanted to do for the NICs to ensure you know, the most resiliency and the best performance at the same time, knowing fully well that whatever we'll provide to you is supported. You can go and try several of the others, or you can trust us that this is the best one because we tried several of the others and we know where the gotchas are. <laughs> so at that, I will pass the button back to Sean. Thank you, Akari. All right. So uh, when we look at uh, the high availability that Arkady just touched upon, right? Um, and you mentioned bonding. So part of the validation process we've done, we actually tested OpenStack from top to bottom. And guess what? The level of bugs we found were just not just in OpenStack. Uh, uh, we found bugs in Pacemaker. We found bugs in bonding, right? Which is uh, two layers below. So uh, just to come up with the perspective uh, solution that actually works, you need to go all across the testing to make sure you find the right solution. So we, when we call this a reference architecture, it's not just a reference architecture. This is a reference architecture that actually can w works, and it's good enough for production. So there's a big, uh, if you d go to the upstream uh, and d d go and download OpenStack and start deploying it, as I said earlier, there's tons of different configuration. But if you want to stand up OpenStack for production, this uh, combination is really, really narrowed down. So this is why, as Orkadi said, we found some areas you only have one choice, probably that actually works. Um, and we talked about Pacemaker, AJ Proxy, and Horizon virt Virtual IP. This is just one uh, slide to uh, uh, summarize how this actually works under the covers uh, with uh, the Pacemaker cloned AJ Proxy service, where we actually have uh, uh, Horizon vir Virtual IP as well that actually can provide you this full uh, uh, um, redundancy. Um, if we look at the progress, we mentioned the progress being done in June. And one example uh, is to take the lay, L3 networking, right, which is the tenant network, and where we were uh, until June release. So in June release, one big uh, accomplishment was done is around the VRRP, the Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol. Until then, we had a single point of failure. So if you're, uh, the host that's running the network agent uh, goes down, Every uh, uh, connected uh, tenants using this service will be pretty much down, right? There's no one to resolve uh, uh, the network for them. So that's actually now uh, resolved in, in RELO SP6 and in Juno. And now we have an internal agent network which created per tenant with keep alive process uh, that is spun, uh, and this is how it looks. So we have a, a, a network node one with virtual master, virtual router backups, as well as uh, 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 network node two and three with the uh, backups with fully redundancy uh, using the VRP protocol. Um, but uh, talking about, uh, as I mentioned, OpenStack top down, uh, we, uh, it's not ending with testing OpenStack, but we also, and I mentioned some of the bugs we found. And, 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 and the bugs, as I mentioned, can be found in different layers. Uh, and OpenStack is just like an onion, right? There's a, a, lot, a lot of layers. And OpenStack, as you know, uh, uh, does not do everything on its own. So if I go ahead and create a, a, a volume in OpenStack, OpenStack actually go and calls Libvirt to do the dirty work and create. So we have a lot of layers underneath OpenStack, which is the cloud infrastructure, that goes to the hypervisor, go to the OS ho that's on the host, uh, all the way down to the hardware. and uh, we are dealt with bugs in the last year that actually were found in the cloud infrastructure, was open for OpenStack, and when we drilled down through the stack, it went all the way to the kernel. And, uh, and when I talk about the co-engineered and integrated from a real OSP perspective, one of the biggest added value we have as Red Hat is actually the fact that we are building OpenStack on top of RHEL. And this actually allows us to not just fix bugs in kernels that we're now doing <laughs> for a lot of years just from the operating system, but we know the stack all the way up. We know QMO, we know Libvirt, we know all the pieces that allows us to support the stack 
all the way down. And believe it or not, another big thing it brings already to the table is the supported hardware. Because we're doing the integration with the hardware drivers already from the operating system. Let alone we're doing it as well for certification for certified plugins with OpenStack. So if I'm a customer, and I just like it, how many of you drive cars here? Just raise your hand. All right. How many of the cars you, you're, you're driving use computers today? All of them, right? Uh, what happens if your uh, brake system in the computer, car computer goes down and indicates the, uh, uh, a problem? Uh, you're on your way from ho uh, work uh, from work to home, right? Where will you go? Would you stop at any shop on the street, please fix my computer car? Because that's a brake system. Or you will go straight to the manufacturer to fix the computer. This is pretty much similar, right? You have to know, if I have a kernel problem in my cloud uh, operation, who would you go to? So this is why we think we're, we're bringing a big value add integrating all of this. And it's not just being able to support the code, it's actually being able to impact the code. Today, we're doing performance enhancements, for example, at the KVM level, at the rel level, to impact OpenStack. So we are able to impact the whole stack uh, to get it better. Uh, so I think that's the message of the co-engineered. And if you connect that to the uh, uh, co-integrated with the hardware, as we done earlier, uh, and Arkady was great to present, uh, then you have a good story. And if you tie it all together to what we we're trying to achieve, uh, this is how we, we actually be able to, to deliver something we can actually uh, w uh, not just stand out that works, but also provide the whole support that is required. And just to, to uh, summarize that, we offer today free year support to OpenStack. And as you know, OpenStack has a, a six months support cycle, uh, uh, release cycle. And what typically, it forces customers, or not just forces, but what do I do? Do I upgrade to Liberty or not? Uh, can, can I stay in Juno or uh, uh, Diablo, whatever version I, I jumped the train of OpenStack at? Uh, so it surfaced a lot of needs in terms of, all right, how do I? Uh, uh, get my Apaches if I stay on, on that release. Uh, will I be able to get similar features backport, et cetera? And of course, upgrades, which is a huge pain point in OpenStack that I'm going to touch upon. So I'm just going to talk about some uh, uh, what, what's expected, right? Uh, uh, what we have next. So we touched upon the, uh, Juno with the L3 VRP support. Uh, Nova, one of the things we're focusing, this is specifically in RHEL OSP, uh, based on the enterprise need that we talked about, the legacy applications that needs HA, which is not there specifically today in OpenStack for them. So one of the things we're focusing now is actually to leverage Pacemaker as well for uh, en enabling instances high availability. So if I'm a user, I, I need to be able, if, sorry, automatically I need to be able to detect the failed hypervisor and migrate all the running instances uh, 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 to another hypervisor automatically. And we're not there yet from that instance's perspective. This is something we invest in. Uh, looking ahead um, uh, to what's next. So uh, I talked about three topics that we, we, we want to focus on uh, that we identify. So I talked about high availability uh, for services. The other two is rolling upgrades and deployment. And as I mentioned, upgrades is a big uh, thing in OpenStack today, right? Uh, uh, how many of you have upgraded your OpenStack environment? <laughs> Good luck. Um, so it, it pretty much involves today standing up another cloud environment and migrating your, your, your workloads. Uh, we are looking to actually provide a much more robust way to do it with minimal downtime and allowing you to do in-place upgrades as well. Uh, and, and the way to do it, of course, is using continuous integration and new methods that are not there. Um, in terms of deployment, uh, we're looking for the easy button installer uh, that enterprise needs, right? So how do I simplify this whole process of deployment with OpenStack uh, in a way? So uh, I'm going to skip this and just talk about the development lifecycle. So the area we identify we want to focus on, the, when we say development lifecycle, is just deploying OpenStack. That's phase one. Once I deploy it, I have a different set of problems. How do I manage OpenStack? What, how do I know, remember the, the car analogy I gave earlier? Uh, so I have a, a problem. How do I know I have a problem in my cloud? Where is the uh, alert in the dashboard? And if it's there, what do I do to control and debug it? Uh, I need to provide uh, APA, open API uh, to my other management tools. I need to be able to add or remove a, a compute node or storage node to my environment. And last thing, how do I introduce updates to my production environment? 
right? I'm not talking about just uh, upgrading from Gino uh, to Liberty or whatever, but patch management, for example, right? How do I do regular updates, uh, take security bugs, right? Zero day security bugs that you need to uh, deploy in your cloud environment. Um, so deployment is more than just the initial OpenStack installation. Uh, it's also deals with the deployment cycle, as I mentioned. And one of the things we're going to introduce this summer uh, with RELO SP7 is RELO SP Director. Uh, RELO SP Director is a new deployment and uh, management tool that is based on Triple O uh, um, that allows us, and also inspired by Spinal Stack, a uh, project that allows us actually to deal with uh, not just the deployment, but also the management aspect. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, this is already available in the RDO uh, uh, Community Edition uh, under the project name RDO Manager. So if you just go to the RDO website and look for RDO Manager, you'll be able to already start look at it. There's demos, there's uh, uh, how to install, how to contribute. Uh, it's available already today for you to start uh, work with it, play with it. And with that, I want to zoom back uh, and, and summarize what we've done so far. So, so we, we saw the enterprise needs, we saw where OpenStack is, and you saw also what approach we took actually to bring it all together in, in a manner that we can support, you can deploy, and you know you have the quiet at night that this will work and not break because someone else has tested for you. Um, and uh, I think that's a, uh, some of the things we uh, were able to bring to the table. Um, and this is actually available today. Uh, you don't have to wait to Liberty release in order to deploy OpenStack. That's a good news, right? Um, so if you scan this barcode, you'll be able to download uh, uh, the Dell and Red Hat Cloud Solution reference architecture. This reference architecture, architecture is not just one. So as Arkady mentioned, we, we started, uh, 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 we, we, you can start with a very small deployment and go to a much larger deployment that, the, for example, a free racks today. Um, and it allows you more than one configuration. For example, take storage, uh, as, as Arkady mentioned, uh, et cetera. Uh, so with that, I want to quickly open it up for uh, Q&A. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to use uh, the microphone uh, up here, and we can try to answer. One of the requirements for enterprise is that the new OpenStack environment has to work with existing infrastructure. Does your uh, white paper or reference architecture has section that describes how you how you set up a new OpenStack architecture that works with the existing? All right. So uh, there's two answers, level of answers. One of them, as you saw, we are very perspective in, in, in the, what the RF uh, uses, right? We, uh, the network, the, the storage we're using, et cetera. So in a sense, it depends what levels of components you would like to change. In, in the, uh, but if you're looking at the, the network models, for example, they're pretty much straightforward. Would, you don't have to change. So if you're looking for specific equipment or specific storage backend, it all depends on the question. And, and I would look, if you need to change anything with there, uh, uh, mainly look at the, if it's certified or not and, uh, uh, from a driver perspective. So, uh, because we actually tested, everything that's show, showcased here is well tested. Uh, so uh, we bring you the, 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 the quiet. So if you change any par parameter there, you need to be able that ev whatever you're changing is certified and tested so, with OpenStack. So I'll just come add one more thing to that. So when we, in, you know, when we talked about the OSP director and uh, one of the capabilities bringing up, when we talk about upgrade, we are not talking about upgrade just of the open stack. We are talking upgrade of the operating system. Uh, we are talking about various components, be it self component, be it pacemaker, be it various else. But going with the support of the Ironic as a part of that, we are also upgrading the BIOS of the underlying hardware to go along with uh, you know closing the gaps and making sure we have the upgrade of the solution end to end not the piecemeal, okay, yeah, I provide you upgrade with the open stack. Well, okay, what about the rest of the solution? Well, you know, we'll have to test exercise to the user or, you know, you go to your vendors and let them upgrade it and uh, pray that when they upgrade that part, they don't break the other one. All right, hope that answers your question. Any other questions? All right, if not, I want to thank you all. Thank you very much for staying until the end. Yeah.